Okay. So, hello, everybody. Um, this is the CUDA and OpenLib seminar um, on May 8, uh, 2023. Uh, today, we have Luis Betancourt uh, from the Monsueto Institute for Urban Innovation at the University of Chicago. Um, Luis is somebody who, um, if you study art history and architecture and urbanism, is not somebody who, as a formation, you would think you meet very early on. I think we met in 2008 when you chaired a session in the Conference of Complex Systems where I gave a talk, which was really, really interesting because that was like the first time I realized that a lot of study of urban cities is driven by physicists. And you are a leading <laughs> figure in that kind of area. And I think we probably learned something about that today. And you're leading this research institute, which uh, brings together uh, sort of theory and practice, quantification, but also architects and very practical applications in one of the most interesting uh, cities for urban development in the 20th century, which is Chicago. Um, and so this is a really, really interesting thing because um, sort of taking a walk in Chicago is almost like urban studies, right? Um, once you open your eyes to it. And so we're very, very happy to have you. Uh, you didn't send an abstract, so we're we will be surprised, which is great. Um, and so we got a two hour time slot. So it's just the housekeeping part. And um, typically like what we recommend, 40 minutes talk, 80 minutes discussion, but you can do whatever you want. You can sort of, we can only discuss, you can talk for two hours, you can take questions in between or at the end. <laughs> so the most important thing is that we have A, a good time, B, uh, sort of some, uh, productive um, hanging out together, which is better than watching other talks on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so should I take it from here, Max? Or yes, for, for a little bit. Okay, is yours. <clears throat> so I'm sorry I didn't send an abstract. Uh, sort of Heidi helped me sort of make the contact, and that got a little bit uh, scrambled. But uh, I will talk about cities, and I'll talk a little bit about. Um, what I thought I'd talk about, looking a little bit at your institute there and uh, your various interests of the people I could see online uh, on the webpage. Um, I think many of you have interest in culture in one way or another, in media, uh, also in, in, in new technologies to some extent, and, and how all these things sort of work together, right? Some, some of you seem to have interest in issues of innovation, how they're created in, in these environments or not. And so I'll, I'll try to speak to all those things, actually. Um, I, in, in some way, it's, it's the fact that uh, cities are quite dynamical spaces of innovation, of bringing people together, of, of complex networks. It's why I study them. I'll say more as I go. But, uh, but, but those issues, so, but I approach those issues quite, uh, if you will, macroscopically. So when you look at one city or many cities, and I think that perspective gives you a number of insights as to how these systems work and provides some starting points maybe for discussion about how uh, some of the same uh, mechanisms uh, in organizations and in systems designed for innovation may work uh, also specifically in, in, in specific contexts. But, you know, sort of going uh, across scales is also an interesting exercise in terms of understanding that sometimes some systems cannot exist at very small scales and, and remain innovative for a long time. So, so there are issues that are sort of interesting that are raised by this. So I'll start with, I guess, some slides as we went. Uh, there will be not particularly polished in terms of just giving you one paper and one result. It'll be a bit of an overview, which I thought, since we're introducing each other, uh, our work to each other, would be appropriate. Uh, and then uh, we can maybe have lots of time in discussion. I'd love to hear more about what you do and what drives you and so on. So let me just try to uh, bring up my screen, but interrupt me whenever you want. I know the format, of course, is, is always a little bit, um, a little bit uh, awkward. So let me see if I share here. Uh, does that work? Do you see that? Yes, it's very good. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, I tried to come up with a title that says Culture and Innovation in Urban Networks. So it's more or less touching a couple of these themes. And um, and so what, what I'll try to say is why uh, are these urban spaces, urban networks ultimately, so interesting from the point of view of not only, so, so there are two aspects I want to talk about. One is structurally, 
if you look at them as a structure, which will be to some extent the physical environment, but also as a as a as a social network of some sort, they uh, they embed culture. So there are a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge that's mostly social knowledge. A lot of it is very tacit; it's not explicit, and some of it is explicit, and becomes also embedded uh, in the meaning of the built environment, in the meaning of a lot of things that are symbolic that we see in these spaces that are there for a reason. And then there's there's also how they change, so the dynamics, if you will, and that is almost the most interesting and the greatest uh, puzzle because it speaks to issues of cultural evolution, but also how structure and function uh, in some sense is connected. So um, I want to talk a little bit about those things as I see them from the perspective of cities. So here's sort of some of my coordinates. I'll get to this again in the end. Let's see. So as always, this is the work of many people. Here are some of them, not all of them. But uh, as, as, as I think you work and, and, and we work, it really is necessary when approaching these issues, even though I am a physicist, I've always been very interested in people and I've been doing the social part for a long time. But we have people here that are uh, uh, not only physicists, but economists, you know, some are psychologists, some are people that worked, uh, came in through anthropology, some are engineering. So there are all kinds of people here that actually come together to have these discussions and produce the work. And that's really what creates the magic is being able to sustain sort of these tensions as well as these creative spaces. So in itself, it's a microcosm of some of the things we'll be talking about. So as Max said, just in the way of introduction again, <clears throat> about five years ago, I had a chance to kind of take a, a lot of these ideas and create an institute here at the University of Chicago. And it was meaningful for me because the University of Chicago, again, as Max said, has a long, long history of thinking about cities as well as thinking about culture in, in other places, as, as you might know. Uh, in anthropology, also interestingly in archaeology, I'll bring some of these themes in. But but the idea was to not just most people that are urban planners that become sort of more applied, if you will. At least the tradition has been to look mostly at the built environment as the vehicle for planning. Uh, that has changed now in the last maybe a couple of decades. But but the idea was to really ask sort of fundamental questions. This is a physicist coming out a little bit. But the idea of what brings people to cities, why do they even exist, right? They seem to be, you know, certainly if you're in Chicago, most of the discussions when people talk about the city is all the problems that it has, you know, has problems of uh, now we having population loss, but, you know, things like there's violence and crime, there's there's been a history of segregation. At the same time, you probably see behind me, there's this roaring city that's being created, that's being built every day where, you know, um, about 10 million people work and so on. So, you know, what? It's kind of a crazy equation, right? That you have these amazing disadvantages, right? Of bringing a lot of people together, but you must have something that's amazing that's happening that people want to do that. And what that is, has always been actually in urban planning, not the focus. And that kind of uh, asks the question, you know, why this happens and what are essentially the processes that, as I say here, drive shape and sustain cities. So in some sense, the answer, as you'll see as we go, but uh, to, to preview it a little bit, is that they create culture and they change the way we live. And they create, in some sense, a lot of the advantages of large scale sociality that humans are capable of, that we don't know how to create in any other way. Uh, now we have technologies like the internet and so on, we can start discussing if we're creating parts of that uh, also online and in other ways. But you know, uh, for thousands of years, cities were the only place where you could kind of sustain this kind of social density and social dynamics in a way that uh, lots of the things that we care about as social beings could come about. So if you will, if you think about humans as, as a curious species, right, where our, our, our endowments are really uh, not so much that we fast or that we're particularly you know, keen on our senses, we could visually, but you know, what we have that's special is really being social. And if you ask, if you're being social uh, uh, and you can create larger and larger societies that have certain properties, how would you do that? Then the process is to create cities and create other instances, we'll see, that are dense networks that can actually bring out our, our sociality in some way. So this is why, in part, cities exist. And the perspective that allows us to start looking at this, uh, and I think many of you are interested, is this idea of taking uh, not just the people, but the networks seriously and try to understand how they work and how they form and how they sustain. So a lot of the talk will be about that. So the problem that I really care about is this one, ultimately. I think it's the one that brings it all together, which is, uh, so this is Shanghai and these are 25 years. 
just in 25 years, you have a completely different society. And I think, you know, whichever city you choose in the period where it changed the most and you focus just, just to focus the mind on a city, typically a large city, then you we tend to see this amazing transformation that in one or two generations, the society completely changes. So again, if you're an urban planner, you may see this as a completely changed urban in, uh, physical environment, as you see here, the buildings, it's what's easy to see. But, but if, if you use the imagination just a little bit, you know that the people in these two pictures are living very differently, right? Politically, socially, culturally, in what they consume, in what they hope for, <laughs> how many kids they have, you know, what they feel, what they worry about, everything. And so there's sort of a sense in which the physical environment, as it's changing in this somewhat more familiar visual way, is also encoding uh, a different way of, of living and making it possible. And so that's what we want to understand. But in general, I want to understand what is this period, this process of development? How is it that human societies change and create, you know, measures that we associate with mostly with progress, right? So, um, so that's that's what I'm interested in. And that came from, I'm also European, so I grew up in Portugal, so sort of the other end from where you are. Uh, and uh, it was a time of, of, of big change, of uh, end of a dictatorship and the beginning of democracy, but also a lot of migration and the growth of the larger cities. And I was very interested in, you know, is this a good thing and how does it happen? And my parents were very involved in, in nonprofit work and, and political work that was local and so on. And I just saw how much effort it was to do all that. And yet most of the time, nothing happens. And then, you know, on a larger scale, uh, over a few decades, you have this sort of transformation. So what, are, what is the logic of this process? How does it work? And so ultimately, this is also about, uh, you know, innovation writ large. So um, this is a quote from sort of, if you will, my predecessors here a century ago, but the people that were uh, trying to study cities here in Chicago. And, to, and so it speaks again uh, about cities and, and many of the things that we create in society, even beyond cities. Um, not just as a physical mechanism or an artificial construction. So this is a point that actually, I think in complex systems and several of the things I think you do, we've, we've come, we've kind of flipped the logic that we thought that a lot of the social organizations, the built environments that we build were art artificial. They are artificial and that they're built by us. But to what extent they are a little bit inevitable that some of what we need to do is encoded in some of these organizations and spaces, but, and we're just becoming conscious of that logic. So I'll try to push that point that that is true. And so that what he's saying here, again, that I started to say is that, uh, is that the vital processes of people who compose it is really what the city is enabling. And that in some sense, it is a product of nature, but specifically of, of human nature, of what we can do sort of with our superpowers as humans. So one, one logical place, if you start from here, from nature, is, is that this is sort of the complex systems talk again, is this idea that there are transitions in nature between um, individuality and collective states. And, and that these uh, have a long history in evolution in, in, in nature and biology, as, as this slide talks about. But, uh, but also occur in human societies in particular ways. And uh, I don't know if you know this literature, it's somewhat interesting, uh, but it gives you many other examples of how collectives come about and the rules and the minimal conditions, which are still being understood about how they regulate themselves and how they work. And so um, typical big transitions that happen that make, make our life possible today are from single cells to multicellularity to the complex cell and so on. But the people that uh, are very famous in, in evolution that wrote sort of the books about this, they always identify the last one of these major transitions with human sociality. And in particular, with the formation of a couple of features that is, they're distinguishing uh, from of human cultures from animal cultures, for example, which also exist and are interesting, but are mostly behavioral, meaning that what is special about humans is that we create a symbolic culture. So we have symbols, we create things that, that have meaning, but they're outside our, uh, you know, our brains and our behavior. They exist in the physical environment. And these things actually create ways in which, uh, you know, we orient our actions and behavior, but also we come together sort of socially. Part of what's important about this point of view is that there are these three ingredients that are always part of these systems. And these are also true of cities. But they're also true in some ways of the systems that we're trying to build on the internet. One is that you need to have basically these individuals come together in some, the word that often is, is spoken about is synergistic way, 
what that means is that behaviors are coordinated and functions are coordinated such that something like collective action, that the action of the collective is different from the individuals emerges. So this is sometimes it's called cooperation or synergy. The second one is that this needs to suppress conflict. This has its dark side as you will appreciate, but that you, you have to suppress or increase the cost of opportunistic behavior. And so this is one of the things we struggle a lot with in Chicago, what's the right level of doing that, and how to do that effectively without being repressive. And the last part that maybe is the most interesting part for, for us here is that you need to create new informational systems to sustain collectives. So this is, this is kind of very important. And it's often, the, it's the part that's not just the physical environment, though it's encoded in it. There's this idea that you need to create new media or data or something that actually allows us to coordinate our behavior. This economist talking in terms of signals, for example, like price being one signal. But there are many other signals, as you know, in culture and the built environment that allows us to coordinate our behavior and be part of this bigger collective dynamics. And with, with every form that we create uh, uh, that's a collective, we in some sense need to create its own little culture and its own media. Some of this is kind of a co-option of media that exists at other levels, like you know, an organization uses many of the forms of, of, of data and language that exist for other organizations, but sometimes they actually acquire its own specific culture that allows their organization to work well. So I want to speak a little bit about that. So, um, and, and start introducing the theme of city. So I don't know if any of you have seen this. This is, this is a few exhibits like this in various major museums. We have a little museum here at the University of Chicago that's very famous for having a lot of written documents from the earliest cities. So these are cities of, of, of summer, of uh, precursors of Babylon and so on that invented some of the early forms of writing in the West at least. And so these are, um, are basically cuneiform, but what, what the sequence on top from the left to right is trying to show you is how the script evolved. And if you know a little bit about this, there were many scripts early on, a bit like computer languages. There were lots of these to begin with, and then there's a certain consolidation. But what you see here is two things coming together. The first is that on top, what you see is actually these tokens that you see sort of to the right on top were actually ways to count, the measures to count numbers. And then as you go to the bottom, you start having something that's a script to convey language. And so what you have here is data and what we consider a natural language or its written form to be have the common structure that the common origin, if you will, in the symbolic system. And so this is typical of, of systems that were created as humans, but you have to ask, you know, why to create them and where were they created? And so the answer is obviously cities. So in cities, it was necessary to start creating systems of accounting, as, as you will know, obviously, uh, and that's the top. But also as you start creating that, you need to have sort of forms of expression that allow sort of uh, the memory of this process and the organization of these processes writ large to start becoming available to many people and for having a memory over time. And so this evolution really tells you that what we often talk about as data, some of you are in digital humanities, I think, but what we think about as text or natural language and, and sort of the humanities, if you will, that these things are really entangled and they came in certainly in the first package. So there's a lot of studies now, sort of the early, uh, uh, sort of the economy of these cities, some of them are still available because we can look at these little documents. And a lot of these, as you know, are Excel spreadsheets. They're just basically showing you what is what is being transacted when, some of these are promissory notes and so on. Some of these dots, for example, are numbers, uh, but, but it's kind of this record needed to be created, right? So this goes to the creation of medium. It's very, very awkward medium by, by today's standard. We have, of course, the evolutions of this, but these media are still with us, right? So you see here on the left, right? So an example, which is just an accounting and a contract, you know, six lambs, one goat. <laughs> this is what people, of course, in this region of the world cared a lot about, uh, you know, when it was due and where it was coming from and maybe what was going and who was responsible, sort of just a contract. And then you start having, of course, politics, political documents, the organization of society that way. And then you start having the humanities as well. So the first poems, and you know, uh, there's a lot of documents of scribes complaining about their teachers. So you'll be familiar with that if you teach. And all kinds of things like this that actually express, you know, things that are very universal about people. You know, the, this poem that, you know, it's very interesting is one of the first ones I tried to collect these first instances of things. Um, it's, it's kind of interesting, but anyway, so this is very contemporary, if you will. But this is a whole new media that just now explodes, right? So one of the things that happens when you bring a lot of people together when you want to is that all these things need to be created. And so in, I like to talk about this as the urban package 
but if you want to generalize the, this a little bit, is really that any big collective needs to have, again, a bunch of things that come with it. So one of it uh, is, is this idea of symbolic culture. Uh, that this takes many forms and often these forms emerge. And in, in the modern world, we think of them as more separated, but I think in some sense, they're not separated. So accounting, of course, written language, standard weights and measures, time and socioeconomic planning. I'll talk about time in a second. Uh, then what you have in these collectives that is, is very salient that you always see, and this is true in all the way, it's easy to see in the first cities because they were simple and smaller, but you have these deep divisions of knowledge and labor. So people start working in networks where they do different things. So this is atypical from, or less typical of animal behavior where there's cooperation of, of individuals who are alike, who are in the same family or shared genes. What we try to do in these systems and happens also in ecosystems at a larger scale is that we create complementarities of knowledge. And this is sort of the glue that's bringing these systems together. So this is why diversity of certain things is very important for these collectives to be productive, but it also creates interdependence. So people now depend on each other. I need to regulate that interdependence. So uh, a lot of this is supported by public goods like the built environment, but also other things. Uh, and by social contracts, things like law, resource distribution is very important. That was a big part of the early cities is to try to invent ways to do that and social policy. And so the result of all this is sort of a system that does something that didn't exist before quite, which is that you create cumulative culture that can change very quickly and has a substrate that is symbolic outside ourselves that can accumulate, also accumulates in ourselves over time. But uh, this means that societies can start to learn and that, as I say here, history begins. If you know, at least classical history was associated with the beginning with an with a invention of writing and therefore very much with a, a lot of exaggeration what I'm seeing, saying here, that societies start learning cumulatively faster. They did that a little bit before, but it was more a hazard. And then you have start having memory. You can, you can, you know, you can see these first voices in in history that you can read about their <laughs> their their triumphs and their problems and, and and their goats and everything. Okay, so this is kind of important. And in some sense, this is what cities always do: is to create this kind of process. And this process transcends the city, transcends the social collective creates something, particularly in the form of culture and information that can be used by others and that persists. So an example is this, right? I don't know if you thought much about this, but the way we tell time, right? Do you know where it comes from? I know Max knows all these things, but so I'm gonna, I'm gonna sort of answer. Sorry, if, if we're in the same room, I would kind of discuss it. But, but some of this, so, you know, why do we use, you know, 60 minutes, 60 seconds, you know, 65 days and so on. So this is encoded, uh, it was encoded by people in Ur and then in Babylon in terms of the sexagesimal system. And, um, and so uh, they also, of course, uh, measured angles and some, some measurements in the physical environment in the same way. But isn't it amazing that our computers are using the system, right? So it was invented by people in the very first cities. And this is the kind of thing that persists. They're just like once it's invented and if it's useful, it evolves a little bit, but it becomes very, very use, useful. And then, you know, it just gets encoded into the future people living in Chicago and, and where you are and so on. That's just like have nothing to do with these places of origin, but carry the same culture, right? So a lot of these systems are absolutely fundamental, but they have this evolutionary character that they become embedded in all societies, right? And then they spread and they become something that can still evolve somewhat in the form it's displayed. It's different. You know how people count, right? So There's this beautiful way of counting 60 on a single hand, right? In two hands. So you count using your joints. So you can go to 15 and then you can do five and that gives you 60. So it's kind of a different way of using your 10 fingers. Okay, so, so this requires sort of these social contracts and these ways by which we manage in conflict and we're at the same time are creating advantage. And so this is again, a quote about, that he's talking about Athens in, as, a, as a classical city, but it's this idea that you need to create systems that at least for a while as a dynamical balance uh, allow people to do uh, to come together as 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 different people uh, in terms of diversity, but also have to create ways in which the fruits of cooperation are redistributed and create a stable system that can grow. So this is always a balancing act. And if you visited any city, of course you are in a city, you know that this is very difficult. It's never done perfectly, and it's always done sort of in a way that's adaptive and often uh, enters big crises. Okay, so. As you look at cities, now we have a lot of data, right? I'm not gonna uh, show you all kinds of data that we have, but a lot of work that we do is because 
uh, from text to the built environments to uh, you know more regular statistics about numbers of people in their professions. I'll show you a little bit about that. But um, their economic productivity, their crime, all kinds of things. We have data that allows us to understand how people, uh, how how these societies work in cities. So, so part of what the program for me has been has been uh, trying to create sort of more fundamental ways of understanding how these collectives work. And so part of what has emerged uh, is this idea that uh, cities or collectives in general are relational. So we need to understand them in general in terms of something like a network. Uh, sometimes we mean that specifically as a specific graph, but in general, we want to talk about uh, the relationship being more important than, than the individuals themselves. What is important about most of these collectives that are interesting and open-ended from the point of view of creating culture and, and, and development is that they, um, they are heterogeneous because they, they entail these complementarities. And so the cost and benefits of being part of these collectives varies a lot. So if you look again at our city, you see people living often in a poor neighborhood, they have lower costs, but they have also lower advantages and whether that's a trap or not becomes interesting. And then uh, the issue of information, they're encoding information, both in the structure of how we uh, live together, but also in what we're trying to do and what we're trying to learn to do that better. So this is always going on. And from the perspective of these three quantities, which you can encode mathematically into models and so on, you can start asking how all these other questions about the built environment, energy systems, economic systems, and so on, whether they're doing the job or not. So when you ask where are cities, you know, there are all these things, right? But in some sense, they are mostly complex networks. You kind of knew this was coming, right? But they're not just any complex network. And what, what is interesting is in some sense, what kind of network are they? But to begin with, I just want to say that there are two kinds of networks and this becomes actually fundamental in getting some math that allows you to uh, make sense of what you find in data. So on the one hand, clearly there are social networks, social by social, I mean, social, economic, political, and so on. They're the relationships between people and by, in some sense, bringing people together over space in some sense over time, they enable these denser interaction networks that actually characterize cities. So what you find in cities is that the networks of uh, their social actually densify, they become denser. And this densification effect, meaning that each person has more connections in general, these connections usually are, uh, are not as tight as you'd have within a family or very close friends, they're more superficial, but, they entail these, this, this exchange of many different functions that become possible in these environments. I'll get to that. That's essentially what we need to describe mathematically. And then uh, this density can keep increasing under certain conditions so that you can create a little town that has sort of a, a, a little bit beginning of this, but you can also create a roaring really large city where these advantages and these densities are very high, but also the costs are very high. And so everything spins a little faster because of that. And then the other part is the part about the built environment. So the built environment is very important. And of course, we kind of know that it's a network. This is a very famous map. Uh, again, uh, speaks to cultures, the Noli map of Rome. It's the first map, I believe, that used a compass. So, and it has this interesting uh, uh, feature that as you can see here, it's, it's sort of a black and white map, but the whites are uh, social spaces and spaces where people live and the black are sort of the more, sorry, maybe I got that wrong. And, and, and the other space are basically the, the spaces that are used, they're private. So this sort of, you see the network as we see so, so often now in people mapping um, sort of physical environment networks. So these two networks actually support each other. So in, in a very poor city or a very early city, you have less of the built environment, right? It's less structured. You also see this in smaller cities. But in very large cities, the built environment becomes very prominent, just like we saw in Shanghai, you see here behind me. So it really structures and makes possible these large scale interactions. And so it has to co-evolve in some sense with these networks in order to sustain them and to make cost benefits of, of socialization possible. Okay, so, so again, this is repeats something I said, so I'm gonna go quickly, but these ideas of connectivity of learning, which is the acquisition of information and its use and sort of the development process that also entails institutions and, and culture are really what cities are for. And, I'm not going to, I didn't know how mathy you were and how much math you wanted, but so I'm not going to do much math today. I'm just going to, but, uh, but if you're interested, uh, I can point you to some of the sources and I have a book about this stuff as well. But, but in some sense, this is all very simple to understand. And I think we have a lot of, a lot of intuition for it, right? So uh, on the one hand, if you live in, in a large city, 
So sort of like this little scheme here on the left, you, you're a person that needs all these things around you, right? You need, uh, you need to be healthy, you need a place to live, you need a source of income, you need um, places to have a little bit of fun, uh, you know, all, you need education, all these things are absolutely become essential, right? And if some of these are not there, so the point is that also these things are not additive, right? They depend on each other in, com in complex ways. So if you don't have a house, if you're homeless, then all kinds of problems ensue, right? Or if you're not healthy and so on. So all these things become interconnected. And But the point is that uh, another thing I wanted to say, uh, which I like to say, is that when you study cities, as I was trying to imagine, you know, how do I build actually a mathematical model of these networks? The problem that was the main problem was that you could not just write a social network, you could write more or less a graph of anything. But what... What, what became apparent as I thought more and more about this is something that's very obvious, which is that networks are not real, right? Uh, they, they're not, you know, they're not a physical thing you measure in general. What you measure is something else like co-presence or coordinated behavior, or that people meet over space, something like this that actually is physical and does exist. And so that's essentially what you need to do in order to start thinking about how a city works is to bring these networks, which are producing a lot of functions in people's lives into as a physical thing, as something that uh, shows, uh, becomes sort of a, a series of encounters of a space and these spaces are built. So if you will, this is sort of the scheme of the same person going around the city. This is like Chicago, because it's a perfect grid and so on. And, you know, it has a few things built in here that I'm not gonna talk about, but you can, can explain that cities have start having not just little streets, but bigger and bigger streets. And highways, these become necessary to sort of tunnel between parts of the city and maintain the cost benefit working. But I won't focus on that. But basically, you go around the city and you have a bunch of encounters that allow you, or some of them come to you, that allow you to coordinate all these functions over space and over time and under an economic budget and uh, for individuals with different needs. So it's really this physical instantiation of the network of a built space that starts making sense of cities. And Often when we think about organizations, we abstract that away, but those costs and benefits are real and somehow they need to be borne by somebody or by the organization itself. And it turns out that the collective needs to do the management of those costs and benefits without which you cannot really do it. Sorry, we have a little bit of uh, um, sort of life going on here as, as we go into uh, breakfast time. Okay, and you can have different people. This is sort of a device for planning is that this introduces also obviously a certain subjectivity in that different people have different needs and at different stages in life and so on. This is an instrument of planning, it's called people-centered people planning. So we put different personas at the center of a network, an ego network, if you will, but this network of abstracted functions. And then you can start asking, you know, what's more important for different people. So, um, okay. So some of the things we see in these networks that sort of became the basis of my work is that when you look at cities and you start now comparing cities of different sizes, uh, this is, uh, you, you start seeing that they have certain properties. So this is, this is called urban scaling ultimately, but it's more interesting to actually just understand how it works. So when, when you compare a large city with a small city, you tend to see these amplifications of social behavior. So here's one, is the economic productivity, meaning wages, GDP, uh, income as well, which is made at wages and profits. Uh, they increase per capita. So people in larger cities tend to see more money coming in, but they also see more money coming out. So costs and benefits are kind of spinning faster, if you will. The money per unit time is, is larger. But you also see other behaviors like crime and it turns out innovation as well. Uh, so for example, crime rates tend to go up. This is one of the problems here in Chicago is that it's quite unregulated. And at the time, it's a huge burden on the city and, and the big problem how to resolve it. But this again is another social interaction. So the point that I was making before is that as these networks become denser, you know, you can access more people in general over space and as you move through space. And this allows you to rob somebody as well as to make money, as well as to have ideas, as well as to catch a disease and all these things. So all these behaviors speed up and we've, we've kind of probed each one of them and other things that I'll show you a couple that are more curious, more recent. Uh, that, that allow you to understand that these denser, faster networks are actually producing accelerated behaviors, but also expressing things that don't become visible until these networks become uh, large enough. So, so we've done a lot of this and there are many uh, uh, essentially quantities that you see here. So on the one hand, the built environment gets a little denser. So what you find is that 
the amount of public space and roads and so on per unit per person actually uh, gets a little bit smaller. So just the, the what you feel when you visit a larger city is that there's less space and that is correct. Um, uh, on the other hand, what you have is these social networks becoming denser, so people having more contact. So these are the same effect. I like to think about it as sort of a social reactor. We're squeezing people in, right? And as we squeeze people in, they interact more. And as they interact more, these social products kind of allow you to exist in this state. And then this maintains this built environment that kind of requires a lot of maintenance and so on. And so this creates sort of a kind of spatial equilibrium where, where the, sub, the physical substrate is maintained by the social networks and allows them to scale up. So there are some exceptions where this doesn't work. And these have to do with very uh, basic societies like hunter-gatherers that don't produce settlements, but when they do, they actually don't have these characteristics yet. So uh, urbanism came a little bit later as people settled and reorganized societies. Uh, it doesn't happen in slums, which is, I spend a lot of my time these days with very detailed spatial data, looking at how they also call the informal settlements when people start forming cities, somewhat ad hoc. Uh, these typically don't have yet the physical network of infrastructure coming in. And this therefore has a different organization. This creates sort of a mismatch with the city, but also freezes in many, uh, it freezes poverty and a, a state of uh, being underserviced a little bit in the, in the sense of the picture before. And this also doesn't happen uh, in shrinking cities. So a lot of the cities that we have that post-industrial actually tends to have more infrastructure than people. And that actually creates a big cost on, on, on the city that still exists there and create sort of another kind of mismatch that also can be understood and is something I'm working now a little bit more on. So these are just illustrations of this. This is used, usually shown in terms of these scaling plots, but just to show you that there are these effects that by which um, this, these 15, 16, 10, 20% of GDP per capita go up. So these are, uh, these are European cities. Uh, employment or things that are basic more or less are maintained. So this is one per person or housing. So these things don't change, even though the houses sometimes get a little bit different in terms of buildings and not so tall and so on. And the urbanized area goes down per person. This is China, another example where the cities have been forming very quickly in the last 20 years or reforming perhaps, uh, but where uh, also some cities were created that have too much infrastructure and some have too much people. So you can kind of analyze this sort of thing. And this is for the United States in terms of roads and in terms of GDP, so more or less same quantities. So I want to just show you a little bit how this works and then move on to uh, more into culture and so on. So essentially the, there are these two effects. This is a little town just to show you how it works. So basically uh, it's, a, it's an Aztec town and these are houses, what you see there in sort of this yellow gold. And a physicist always just puts, you know, uh, a sphere on it. Uh, so, so you ask, you know, how big is it? And you could, you could characterize this by a single spatial dimension, uh, sort of like a radius, but why isn't it smaller? Why isn't it bigger? And so the simple way to, to look at this, just having a first feel for it, is that if you move around and have uh, interactions in the space, a bit like I was showing you before, then uh, you can convince yourself through a low calculation that the number of people you can meet is, is proportional to the density of people in that space. So it's basically the, the path that you'll, you'll take over that space divided by the area times the number of people that you see there and that expresses the density. So that's basically, let's say that these interactions at least on balance are positive. And then you have the cost of moving around which basically goes with this R as well. So when you bring these two things together, this is an old idea that geographers and economists had used before to try to form a spatial equilibrium. You basically find these, these two equations that express how the area on the one hand and uh, the products of social interactions on the other hand go with the size of the settlement. And so they go, as you can see here, uh, the area for this very simple model, which I call the amorphous model, goes with an exponent of two thirds. So it's sort of the elasticity of growth of population and social interactions go with four thirds. So this one is sublinear, another superlinear, and this is creating sort of this agglomeration effect. This is not the right number. In order to get the right number, you have to put this on the structure, the built environment that we create in cities. And that gives you more like one sixth, but that is too, a bit too complicated for, for a talk like this, but I'm, I'm happy to express that. But the, what I want to say just about that is that if you can create, uh, if you kept on going like this, you would create something that's indeed a little bit more like an informal settlement or a slum. And this density would increase too fast and you would jam the system. There would be no space to move around anymore. And so what happens is that 
the largest cities create this this network, the network of streets, basically, and in modern cities, other things like subways and so on that allow the system to keep moving and people keep moving, but that uh, has certain features that allow a different kind of scaling. Okay, so, but I want to come back to this idea of culture and diversity and how we form organizations, which is that when you create these social networks, they're not like, um, the, the sort of social networks of organizations that because this is very costly to bring people together, certainly in cities, but in other ways as well, then we need to kind of pull resources and pull information. That's what organizations do, create collective behavior, but then redistribute the, the source, the, essentially the products of that, of that uh, process back to individuals. And this is the basis essentially of what makes societies difficult is whether this is fair and whether this is worth it. But part of what needs to be done is to understand what are the benefits of bringing people together. And these can be expressed in terms of pooling information together. There's a property of information, which is not a property of energy, which is related to this fact that what you know and what I know may actually allow us to do more than what we could do individually. So, right, we could write a paper because we know different things, right? Or we can create a firm or a business because we know different parts of it. So this is called synergy and it's actually creating a lot of this super linearity. It's allowing collectives to do more than some of the parts, if you will. And it's a purely informational effect. It's something that doesn't exist sort of in the world of energy uh, and, and money. So this is kind of a way in which uh, we've been uh, sort of developing a new program to try to understand process of development. And I'll just give you some windows into it. It's a bit more complicated, but we can go into it, if you will, in discussion. So I want to go a little faster on this because this will take us to the end. But one of the things that's amazing about cities, I think Max and I were discussing this, right, is that a city like New York, most cities you actually don't know because we have not had census of this. But in New York, there's been a good census of languages spoken. And there's sort of this estimate that's between 600 and 800 languages. So here's a, a project, you may know about it, uh, which we just tried to uh, sort of not only inventory, but also map all the languages that are spoken in, in New York City. And so again, they, you know, as they say here, it's kind of an amazing thing, right? That in a city what you think you you might have homogeneity, right? That everyone should want to speak English. You actually are maintaining these these little languages that don't exist anywhere else. So this is just a little expression of the kind of diversity that cities can sustain for reasons that are not very well understood, right? But they have to do essentially with the fact that they do sustain um, diversity. So there have been many theories to try to explain this. They're sort of ecological, that have more of this feeling that there are complementarities in what people do and what they know, and that these have certain advantage. They're not just disadvantages that everyone should go and learn English. Somehow the cultures that these languages are signaling uh, can exist and do exist and persist at least for some time. So one idea is this idea of subcultural theory of urbanism. Uh, I won't dwell on this a lot, but it's trying to, it's an old idea in sociology. This goes back to the seventies, but it's this idea of why you create diversity and not homogeneity. So the opposite of homogeneity in these environments. And, and why is this encoded both again in what we see structurally, but also what people do over time, right? So, so this has, is kind of a certain feel to it that has to do with the fact that it's an open system. I won't explain all this because it's complicated as you can see here, but uh, you can read the paper or, or see it in my book, the way it's explained a little bit more. But it's this idea that there's intrinsic variety that comes because cities are open systems and people from many different places come, but that this is also kind of sustained in groups that have a certain group identity that both compete and complement other groups in ways that allows them to persist as such, right? So a, a community of speakers has to, has to be a collective. And so this allows essentially this, this rich ecology to start uh, being relatively stable and to encode more and more diversity. But these processes are kind of dynamical and complicated and sometimes they go away, right? And there's a drive for homogeneity and some other times because of either group competition or because of complementarities, they can stay. Okay, so this reminds you of something like this, but uh, it also reminds you of something like this, which comes from evolution. So as an evolutionary process, so that was Darwin, right? And it was the problem that uh, people in evolution were trying to explain the reason why that was there. Sorry, it was a little bit uh, un un uncalled for. But is that uh, the problem was the problem of biodiversity, the same problem we're asking here about cities. Is It was not so much where, where people come from or uh, it was really why is nature so diverse and, and why is a bugger a feature? 
And so one of the explanations, at least for systems that evolve that encode information structurally and where uh, different part, you know, different pieces, different parts of this information can be amplified or deamplified is this idea that evolution is faster if there's more diversity, right? So this is, this actually is the most important equation of evolution. It's called Fisher's fundamental theorem and shows you, it's a very simple result in the end. It shows you that the pace of evolution, uh, the change in fitness here is actually proportional to the variance of fitness in the population. So if you have a very even system, it doesn't move because in some sense it's, it's, too, it's too homogeneous. There's nothing to choose from. But a system that's more uneven, particularly along many dimensions, then has many opportunities for different things to be amplified and to carry other things with them and so on. And this is the nature usually of evolution, of a process that's not always directed, but that allows to take diversity as the beginning of sort of what the future will look like. So all systems that are evolutionary do benefit from maintaining uh, diversity, uh, essentially as, as, the, as the basis, as, as the momentum that allows them to have a future and continue to adapt. Now, in cities, I just want to show you a couple of things that are ways in which this is expressed. One has to do with the fact that people do different jobs, right? Something pretty basic. We have good data for this. This is for the United States. And so as you can see here, this is before COVID and all that. Uh, and so a lot of people did jobs like retail and cashiers and so on. You see here what they, what they earn and so on. But these are the most common jobs. And, you know, there's a whole classification which mirrors in some sense old ways in which biologists did taxonomy in terms of what are the different things that people do and how can we classify them both in terms of businesses and in terms of jobs. So, you know, this for, for example, some sectors in the arts, sort of a way in which the statistical agencies of the United States and other countries do this. But what this does is to allow you to start to see what this diversity looks like and how is it structured. And so what's also interesting is that this diversity, when you measure diversity, you can never measure at a, you know, if you look for more and more resolution, you end up with more and more diversity typically, right? So you see this, if you study language, you know this, there are more and more words as you see more and more text and so on. That's one expression of something like that. But this is true in professions. If you start asking, you know, what kind of scientist are you? Are you a social scientist or, or a natural scientist? Are you an anthropologist or a sociologist? What kind, are you a cultural anthropologist or a biological anthropologist? You can keep going, right? And so, Part of the problem is that you cannot look at diversity without looking at a scheme that allows you to look at resolution. But when you do this, basically, this is what you find in American cities, and this has been done in a few other cities, that diversity increases, diversity of professions in this case, increases with the size of the city, but also looks like it's saturating. And in this paper a while ago, we showed that um, we think it's saturating because the classification scheme is not big enough. And you can more or less estimate that in a city like New York City, you'd have something like you kind of take a limit, stuff the physicists like to do once you understand sort of the scaling here that you see here on the left. And you can take this N zeros uh, uh, and D zeros, which are basically uh, scheme dependent in a certain limit and show that essentially what you'd have is something that uh, is scaling up diversity with an exponent of about five, six. So the number of professions in this case increases with N to the five, six. And so you, you can check that and that seems to work. But what that means also is that there's a, there should be a universal decomposition of this diversity uh, with city size. And that's also what we see. So that's kind of amazing. So what this means is that typically this a statistical statement, you don't usually get a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon or, or a patent lawyer or you know, an opera singer in a very small town. It's very rare. Partly because you know what you're gonna do being a rocket scientist in a small town, right? You have to go to a place where that knowledge makes sense. And so what you find in larger and larger cities is that a lot of this diversity, a little bit like in biology, is latent there. You know, we have people who are doctors already, right? But they're not yet brain scientists. But as you get to a larger and larger city that services more and more people, people can specialize further. And you start having people that are dedicated to functions that were there, but they were not specialized. And therefore, they were not deep in terms of knowledge, become deeper and deeper and become, therefore, new knowledge of a sort. So this is basically what we see in cities, is that uh, larger cities have, have more specialized knowledge that sort of networked with everything else. That's what allows it to be there. But that as you go uh, across cities that are larger and also to some extent more prosperous, you tend to see these new things pop up as new functions, specialized functions that you can see and give it a name. And so there's sort of this, this dichotomy between the size of the network and how many connections people have 
therefore how much support they have in specialized functions and what they can specialize in as well in terms of creating value back into the network, but also being able to make a living. So we argue that this actually is a complementarity that in the network, the number of connections, you also have sort of the diversity that people can take. It's kind of an informational argument, kind of a cheap one, but that just is saying that if, if somebody, you know, cooks my meal and takes care of my house and my car and so on, I can become a scientist because then I don't have to be doing those things all the time, right? And I can specialize in that. And then that knowledge is good for society and somehow it all works out. So this is more or less what we see. And it's important, again, that as, as, uh, as you think about creating environments of that embed knowledge, but also that create knowledge, that these structural transformations, in some sense, uh, need to be latent in order to people to go a little deeper when necessary in terms of knowledge. OK, so you see this, this is more or less the same argument. And I just want to show you, this is a paper I wrote a while ago, show you that as technology changes, some of this can become also easier to do. And so the idea here is, is to take this to become a mechanism. It's consistent what we see in cities, but increasingly it's consistent what we see in other networks as well. So this is kind of very schematic, but I think it's interesting that in poor societies, societies that have more to do with subsistence, you tend to have people that have a lot of knowledge, but they're more or less uh, the same knowledge as their neighbors. So for example, a simple example, there would be subsistence farmers. They know a lot how to do that, but everyone's doing the same thing. So the knowledge in society doesn't scale up. It's the same knowledge. Each person has more or less the same knowledge, each household. But when you go to an urban society, or what I want to really express as a connected society, then what you have is the strong interdependence where new things can be created because the network is allowing that specialization to exist. And this, as long as the connections can be maintained that cheap enough relative to the, to the productivity, you can increase productivity, you can increase the embedding of information, and you can create a completely different system, right? That now looks like it's innovating, it looks like it has all these complicated structures made, made up of people are very diverse, and they're all interdependent in a complicated way that makes it all work most days, right? And so this is what I call sort of the connected phase. And this is typically uh, physical and social instantiation, if you will, a division of labor and division of knowledge, but one in which you can start appreciating that these things that scale up and that become open-ended in complex systems become possible. Okay, so you can write some equations for what this looks like. This is inspired by cities, but things like the connectivity increases, the number of functions in the system increases, but decreases per person because people are specializing. Um, uh, information on the whole increases because people go deeper. And when you start seeing that the knowledge of people doesn't overlap, therefore uh, start scaling up as the number of people in the, in the system um, increases. The economic productivity tends to go up. The time per function increases because people are more specialized and this means that they can learn to do things better. And the cost per connection also goes up. So these things have to pay for itself in terms of a cost benefit. Okay, so this is okay. So, so this is a logic that I want to maybe discuss a little bit with you if you're thinking about things like this as you think about your systems. But just to show you that, I call some colleagues, not me, uh, actually started looking at. So we had measured this in terms of professions for the U.S. And these colleagues were Romanists, so they went to look at. Um, I know this one's for Max because he may like these things, but these are documents, right? These are called stele. Uh, and they're from collegia, so basically from uh, colleges, we'd say today, but really uh, they're more like uh, guilds. Uh, so this, for example, this guy was a carpenter, and the guild actually creates these stele that commemorate the person. So you have these different stele that promote or by trade uh, guilds, and so you basically can see people, but you can also see what they did. And so once you, because these became very popular, there are sort of tens of thousands of these, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, you can actually uh, see what kind of professions exist in different cities, and you can tell a little bit more. In some cases, it's a nice one. Not all of them are this nice with so much text. But uh, so some colleagues, again, went to look and, and, and found that uh, the number of professions in Roman cities also has the same characteristic as you might have expected, of course. But the exponent is slightly different because Roman cities have a somewhat different scaling for reasons I'm not going to get into. But but it's as predicted. So this is kind of amazing, right? That you know you can go to these different systems, the past, the future, and so on, and start to see, at least have predictions and try to see how they're put together. So this is the internet. Also, I did a study that should be done much better today, but a few years ago for that paper that shows you that the internet is all sub super linear, meaning that there are all these productivity enhancements with with uh, 
with people that are online, uh, for example, in terms of web pages, there are more web pages per person, there are more active pages in this case, more hosts, you know, basically um, uh, managing the links between people and organizations, web pages, and so on. So all this stuff is actually even more spectacular in terms of how much it grows with online population faster than cities because there are less constraints spatially. But also what's conserved is basically the effort per person. So you can see that as well in things like Wikipedia, that the number of uh, contributions per person is more or less fixed. But yet, because there are more people in the system and these documents encode connections, the whole system starts having some of the same superlinear characteristics in terms of the production of knowledge and its structural characteristics. So this is kind of interesting. The exponents are very different. They're actually more spectacular, bigger. Uh, but at the same time, the internet still doesn't do everything. So there are some aspects of it that are still limited. So, and this is sort of a study that just came out and it has to do with, uh, with uh, social networks and depression. So people have larger social networks are less depressed. And we see this also at, uh, at the city level. There are other factors that people in pockets of the city that are more isolated, more segregated, for example, are known to be more depressed. So it, this is not to say this is a panacea that everyone is on the average, quite the contrary. But there's a little effect of larger networks that allow people to feel more agency and to uh, and to be in this case uh, stave away depression. And this is about human development. So I'll skip this, but this is also a characteristic of larger cities. And I think I'll end with this, which is a famous quote from important political leader Amal Kerry, but also you know a philosopher of a certain. This is something that's been said by many different people in many different ways, but he says it very well in one of the most important documents in American history, as you know, the letter from Birmingham jail. And um, so I'll just read it. Uh, in a sense, all life is interconnected. So it goes to the perspective I introduced you with that some of the things we see here and that even in sociology, people like Durkheim was emphasizing division of labor and division of knowledge are in some sense already a natural phenomenon. But all people are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Uh, whatever affects one affects all indirectly. I can never be what I want to be until you are who you want to be. And you can never be who you want to be until I am what I ought to be. This is the interrelated structure of reality. Now, this is true in the way we live today, but it's not always been true, right? In some sense, there was a time where more or less everyone could be more or less the same and stuck in that position. At least one imagines that it was a bit more like that. But in some sense, the moment that we become interdependent and that we allow each other to become who we ought to be and other people to do other things. And for this process to actually to create advantages to societies and organizations, then all this becomes possible. And this is what we see in cities when they work well. We always see it, even when they don't work very well, but is in some sense the magic and this magic is encoded really in relational networks. They're encoding information and they're in some sense through that process also creating options for the future that tend to create development. So that's my opening salvo. I'm very happy to discuss and get into things in more detail. We do lots of things, lots of data. This is not that kind of talk. This is just introducing us. But uh, a lot of the stuff about cities is, is written uh, in this book that just came out recently and my coordinates are up there. So I'm gonna stop sharing and see uh, if we can go a little bit into discussion. Yes, so thank I apologize for some noises because because we're just getting to school now. So yes, I'm not. But <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you very much. This was a really fantastic overview, um, and there's so many. I have so many questions, but um, I'm primed with being urbanly inter interested, I guess. So. Um, if anybody uh, has a question, please sort of raise your hand um, and then take one after the other. I can, um, if nobody has their hand raised, I will start. Um, Mike has a hand raised. Mike, go on. Okay, well, I have, thank you very much. It was uh, lovely, interesting. And, and uh, I have, well, several small uh, Questions. Uh, one is well, I seem to remember there was some discussion of this in the literature, and maybe you can comment on that. When you showed this result for the uh, scaling properties, so some some properties of the cities growing 
super linearly with population size. How sensitive is it to, to, to the definition of the city? Because obviously nowadays it is, it is quite, well, quite unclear how to define a city, whether it, is, whether it should be in administrative boundaries or uh, whether it should, should be metropolitan area or constant yeah, yeah. map area, et cetera. And I think it might be sensitive to that. And, 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 well, and another question I wanted, well, sort of cluster of questions I want to, to ask you to reflect upon because uh, is basically as follows. Uh, you, you sort of underlined the importance of invention of writing for the development of cities in, in the first part. Uh, but I think we know that sort of quasi-urban settlements uh, uh, appeared in history for, for several millennia before uh, development of writing. But probably there is some some, some sort of uh, uh, size limit of what you can have without without writing. Maybe you can. Uh, is it true or ask? So, so so it looks like there are some uh, some innovations which sort of open up the the, the the chance for city to grow larger than than previously possible. Uh, and in relation to that, even uh, given that that you have talked so so much about about history of cities, uh, have you ever looked at this question whether the floor or something like this, which we believe uh, sort of uh, uh, is typical for, for, for the city side distribution now, whether it whether it is valid for, for I don't know, for, for mid, middle ages, for ancient cities, et cetera, or is there a typical size of city back then? And maybe it is because it is somehow limited uh, by, by uh, uh, well, like, um, Technologies which were available back then. So that's sort of I, I, I'm sorry for being meandering, but basically there are these two questions. One. Okay. Can I answer? Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I, I think that uh, the answer to all three is um, function. We have to be so the way I describe the city and is on purpose, but it's also I believe it's fundamentally true, is as as a network effectively. Uh, so the city is not an administrative boundary or a density or a set of buildings. I mean, that's there to support it, but that's not its fundamental essence. So this is why theory matters, right? You see what the theory allows you to see. I think Einstein said something like that. And if you have the wrong theory, you're going to see something wrong. So these issues of definition of cities have a lot to do with different theories or the absence of theory in, ma in many cases. So I've had this discussion on and off for a long time with Michael Batty, who was a, a geographer, urbanist in London and, and some of his colleagues, Al Sarkout and others. And the, the point is that of course you could go and define things in different ways and you will break scaling at some point because you're not capturing the entire network. So the point about, so the best definitions that we have that were created Precisely, they were created with an economic motivation in mind, which is to capture the full GDP of a city. Our metropolitan definitions, because they're based on all the people, they based first on, on commuting flows as a proxy for the network link. So the idea that all these people are interacting, in that case economically, but also in other ways. And if you capture all those, then you get a city that has the right, in that case, economic properties, but turns out scaling properties, as I described to you. Um, if you start actually constraining that in certain ways, you can get all kinds of different results because, because the, the physical boundary of the city is not the primary quantity. It's, it should be a derived quantity. So, so definitions last, right? Function first, definitions follow, not definition and then function. So, so that's very important. That's sort of debate we've been having for years. But uh, what, what sort of 
uh, we have shown in many, many different cases is that if you use metropolitan definition or definitions that are more, they tend to be larger definitions in terms of also how big the city is, especially, uh, then those have these network properties that are non-trivial. If you do density-based, um, some people like to do in, in geography and some of the work that they did that uh, was kind of showing different results, density-based um, definitions of cities. So the idea is that once it, it falls below a certain density, you stop calling it part of the city. And that's a pretty terrible definition in terms of how, because people now with cars and so on live at very low densities. And they're also sometimes satellite towns that are kind of involved into what a large city is like as a network. And, but if you do that, you'll appreciate that density is N over A. And so for small cities, if you N over A is fixed, then A goes like N, it's linear. And you lose the effect, you put in something else. So that's what you see for small cities. It becomes linear in that case. And they find that result, but it's trivial in my opinion. So again, you you have to kind of have these definitions that are uh, speak to, to the theory, to the fact that it's a network. And then you find almost always the kind of results I showed. So that's one. Uh, number two had to do with, um, so sorry, right. number two had to do with ancient settlements that didn't have writing uh possibly um so we know little about settlements that existed that don't have a lot of writing and and built and that left built environment uh there's a, a big there's been sort of a, a set of discoveries including sort of uh in in northern and eastern europe of large seemingly large settlements that seem to have been impermanent but have some persistence and these I've been studying at the moment, I'm not the expert, but I discussed a little bit with some colleagues who are archeologists. They have a lot of the characters of, even though they can acquire large scale, they have a lot of the character of what we see in hunter-gatherer camps. So they're not permanent. They don't, uh, people don't live there forever. They're more seasonal and they don't always densify in the same way. And uh, they've not left us a lot of symbolic culture. Some, but not, not a lot in terms of language. So the point about what I was telling you about and my argument was that at some point something happens and you have cumulative culture that's, that's partly made possible because of an explicit, explicit symbolic system that comes in. And that allows cities, it's not like cities could not have existed in some incipient way before that, they certainly did. But at that point, it becomes, somewhat more stable and then it can grow and spread not just as itself but also as other cities that do similar things so that was my point is that once that happens you do, do change the world forever irreversibly before that there seems to be a lot of ebbs and flows of seasonal settlements and so on that are very characteristic of of hunter-gatherer societies these societies did accumulate culture but it was but they also lost a lot of culture along the way uh, because partly it was not easy to transmit and maintain in other ways, so that's what we know. But there's a lot of uh, there's a lot that's being uh, discovered uh, with new archaeology using new methods and so on about those transitions. My view, and in the paper that we wrote, from which some of the statements about hunter gatherers came from, but this is working. There's more work in progress. Is that these societies um, not only didn't have these symbolic systems, they also they tend to have a lot of problems regulating conflict. Uh, and so they usually, when they when they settle, and this is also true of some some of the, uh, I think some of these uh, cultures in in parts of today's Ukraine and so on, they they kind of settle in relatively sparse ways, often in a circle. It's kind of there, somewhat these there's sort of this ring model, and this scales in a different way. But but these societies have a lot of problem regulating conflict. So usually, when there's a lot of conflict, people walk away, and that's the way it's regulated. So the settlement explodes. Um, so you observe this in, in better known anthropological uh, hunter-gatherer societies uh, for some of these archaeological cases, we don't know for sure. But it seems that uh, when people started densifying places and at the same time having symbolic culture and more or less following the logic I was describing, it seems that uh, they also have these political and cultural innovations that allow them and also built environment innovations that allow them to regulate conflict and be able to have some rules so that people can live together. So that seems absolutely important. So, and the other problem that you were mentioning that is more clear, but it seems to be sometimes less essential is, is can, can they feed themselves? Does the ecology allow uh, 
sufficient at a large site to exist. So we find some sites that are kind of curious, uh, if you're interested in that, in that sort of thing. There are Pacific Northwest sites where uh, these societies are classified as hunter-gatherers. They live off salmon, but they are settled because the salmon runs are in a certain place and these are very rich uh, stocks. So they, they want to be there. And these look like little villages that ob obey already a lot of the sort of expectations that we have. So there are transitions like this where you need both material resources, but also the social and political institutions to start being able to live together. And it seems that these early, there are many early attempts at, at being urban that didn't kind of catch to <laughs> follow the logic then that simplified. Yeah, it seems so, you know, the, this kind of, uh, particularly this ebb and flow that seasonal is very characteristic. Um, so, you know, there's a bit of a question whether we should call those cities or not. They're sort of certainly latent cities, but I'm not sure if they're cities in the sense of permanence. And to the last question, which is uh, interesting about Zip's Law. So Zip's Law is kind of has a weird status in geography, right? It was almost the first thing that people seem to have discovered almost a century ago as a property of, of, of systems of settlement. So for, I think all of you guys probably know it. I know some of you do linguistics, so there's an analogous thing there. But if you look at the size of the largest city and the size of the second largest city and you rank order them, then you find that uh, the size of the city is predicted by the rank uh, uh, following basically uh, a one over rank. So that's that's Zip's law. It also corresponds to a probability distribution for city sizes of one over the size to the power two in the strict form. And sometimes people generalize that to a different power. So Zip's law with power two is special and it's very simple. It just follows from a multiplicative random process that that has a boundary, has a boundary that doesn't allow sites to become too small or that doesn't measure them when they become too small so so what we so zip's law is essentially a neutral law i wrote a paper about this it's also in the book chapter right but zip's law it's just if you have a system of settlements so people are moving around without preference they're just moving a person in each settlement at some point has a probability of leaving and go to another settlement proportional to its size that part is important but if people are doing that so it's sort of a neutral migration mixing system you get zips law so it's kind of like uh, a, a zero order law of a sort and it's never really observed strictly <laughs> but it's observed once you aggregate the data a lot and you squint at it you tend to see something that looks like that it always fails for small settlements for example because because of this issue of the boundary so it's kind of a rough approximation to what's going on but it, it tends to express this neutrality of growth we, in which all settlements would be growing at the same rate, which implies that if people are moving around them, they're moving around them in a balanced way, essentially in some sort of equilibrium at the urban system level, which is an interesting statement why that should be. But but that's what, what, what one finds. As and one looks, just, yeah. So, it, yeah, you know, go on, sorry, Max, you had a question. Is it, is it, is it true? No, there's no balance, uh, detailed balance, right? No, right. So, you know, there isn't, there isn't, right? To the extent that you observe Zip's law a little bit, as, as, as Mike was asking, it's not totally wrong. You know, in some sense, when you look at actual flows of people between cities, what you find is that there are more people coming and going than the net. The net is quite small, whether in the net, some people are going from this city to that city, right? So there are more people coming and going. So the flows are much larger than the difference between the flows, which is the net. Uh, but but definitely there are nets. There are places at each time, and these these patterns tend to, you know, last for a few decades. That are preferred, right? So people are coming to Berlin. I don't know at some point, and then they were leaving Berlin, and then they were coming back, right? And then uh, or you know pick pick your city. Uh, I don't know the history uh, a little bit of the Baltic states so well, so I'm not going to go there. But <laughs> uh, but but you know in the U.S. you know Chicago is a boom city, and now people are leaving, and people are going to Texas and to Florida. No one understands why exactly we can get there. But you know, there's a certain permanence of these migration flows that lasts a long time. So when you look at these, these break Zip's law. They break this neutrality, which is at the basis of Zip's law. And they're important, right? People have these preferences. But if you aggregate over longer times, or if the uh, urban system is more balanced in the sense that no place is preferred, then you effectively have that Zip's law emerges more clearly. And yes, ancient systems were quite Zipian. They have some bits of zip, but uh, sometimes they have larger cities than there should be. Sometimes they have smaller cities. In ancient systems, it's hard to measure the low ones. The small places are often not, not, 
not studied. And so it's a little bit harder to know, but there've been many studies from medieval cities by Brodel and so on. And then people followed up on that data. You know, they're reasonably Zipfian, but you pick any country, I don't know, famously England or France, they have a very large city, right? That dominates everything. So it's not Zipfian in that way. Uh, but if you go to a place like Germany or Italy, because they were also not unified countries, perhaps, uh, they don't have a very large city. So he breaks Zip's law in the opposite direction, just to go with the big cities. For the small cities, you know, Zip's law would predict that if you have a city of 20 million people, say like we have in the US, then you have 20, you should have 20 million cities of one person, you know, and 10 million people, of two people, and so on. And you don't definitely have those. So it doesn't work for very small scales. So, so that's kind of interesting. But that's the state of Zip's law at the moment. You can understand it, but almost the exceptions are interesting because they're expressing preferences for specific cities and the fact that some cities are going faster than others. Now, it's an interesting question. I'm not going to answer it unless you ask me, but why would people prefer larger cities or smaller cities? You know, I told you that there are cities of more or less of a large range of sizes and they're scaling across these scales. So but some things are getting more attractive and some things are getting less, less attractive. And for anything like that to persist, these things must somehow cancel out. Thank you very much. Um, I, let, let me ask a question which is uh, sort of um, related to what we just said. So the city of Rome uh, is, is curious in that it seems to have a sort of constant share of noted people over 2000 years, which is super weird because all other cities sort of have a slope and they're different in slope in aggregating stuff, which changes every couple of centuries. You know, it's like places are awesome for a while and then, you know, they move to Texas and then they find out there's a guy called Ted Cruz and then they move out again. And yep. so for Rome, it seems like it's sort of like, you know, uh, a centrally located internet switch that is sort of like always having the same number of packages flowing through and never changes. But one of the weird things that you said is, it was sublinear during the Roman Empire, this kind of scaling thing for Roman cities. While no, no. Point, not for the city of no. Rome, but for cities in the Roman Empire, right? Yeah, well, yeah. I, I understand. No, that uh, was professions, but we don't know, we don't have actually for Rome direct measures of economic output or, or uh, the superlinearities we'd like yeah. to see. We know that the um the the physical, what we have is the physical spaces. They're, they're, they're closer to this one third laws. Um, so we measured that quite well, actually. We had a, mm -hmm. this amazing, um, you should meet him, uh, uh, his amazing postdoc who's now faculty, he's just moved to Oxford, um, uh, Jack. Um, yeah, so he, he um, sorry, his name is gonna come in a moment, but he, he, did a, uh, he did the biggest census of Roman cities. Um, uh, and and we could and a lot of them were excavated or uh, were documented because a lot of them the built environment was part of the modern environment, and so we know that they densify in a way that's a bit more extreme than we have in modern cities, mm -hmm. and we think that they had very large blocks with a lot of informal packing inside of them, so they're missing some infrastructure to get to the cities, so to get to each each building, so it's mm -hmm. kind of a curious thing, uh, but basically it would be predictive of cities that as they grow large, they become very, very, um, um, uh, very, very uh, congested. Mm -hmm. And 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 so we know that uh, Roman cities had a bunch of law, you know, for example, traffic could only circulate at night for certain uses and so on and things like this. And of course they didn't have flyovers and, 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 uh, and you know, underground space. They had some, but not a lot. Uh, but so there are issues like this, the adaptations of modern cities that they didn't quite have. And so their cities seem to have been actually very dense as they grew mm -hmm. larger. And Rome was notorious for that, for example. So, um, so my, my question regarding this is because obviously, like particularly the case of the city of Rome itself is mm -hmm. a place where, um, where this, there, there has to be a transition where it is modern. And there yeah. was a moment in time, but it was let's say Rome, like where you had yeah. this inverse thing, like you moved in spaces, not in roads and stuff like that. So, right. so, so is there some, I mean, the problem with Rome is it was sort of empty in between, but like, do you think this is something, something one could capture in a model going from a system that sort of like functions in one way 
to going to this thing that uh, functions in another way because there must have been some kind of transition. And yes. instead of fall and rise would be the boring version of it, but maybe there's something in between. And why I'm thinking that is if you look at something like Tamugadi, where the official part, the rectangular part of the city is exactly how he described, but that was like not the place where people favored to live. They lived in the other half of the city that was approximately the same size outside of the rectangular part where it was more like an aggregating complex system, which you can still see from a satellite picture, which looks crazy and, and, and definitely more interesting. So the question is, <laughs> do, you, do you think this is sort of something where, um, do, are you familiar with work that does this or is this something that should be done more because it feeds directly into your sort of call for function first definition later? Because it seems like we talk about, you know, Roman versus modern in a, in a, in a sort of- yeah weird predefined way basically yeah yeah exactly no you're exactly right so there there are several approaches to that problem it's a very interesting problem because it's precisely revealing if you will the network's forming or at least changing character right mm -hmm. uh so at the moment i'm i'm doing sort of a bunch of people here uh, a lot of work on slums and informal settlements and basically because we've seen the cities of africa and india we have very good data for cities of africa now Forming, if you will, this way. So, so there's a lot of uh, their cores of cities that have have the usual, you know, um, networks of streets and so on. And then you typically have peripheries or pockets also. They were not settled for various reasons. Mm -hmm. There are they have the houses first and have the very more random structure, not random, but you know, more uh, accidental structure at least compared to more modern to more planned cities. But then you you see the network extending as well. So 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 basically, what's happening is that if people settle in certain ways, or if cities are organized in certain ways uh, that don't have this match of settlement and houses to infrastructure, then it typically implies that people live differently. They mm -hmm. don't have access to the same functions, and 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 they typically are excluded and poorer. Not always, but but it's harder for them to be plugged in. The cost benefit in terms of plugging in is different. They usually have lower costs because they're settling, you know, in a way that's not formal and so on. But they also have a less connected, so they have ben uh, lower benefits. So it's a latent situation where mm -hmm. the city is kind of wanting to form, but it's not formed yet. And and you see it extend. And often, what you see then historically is that you see that network structure extend, and that was true also. Uh, of Rome. Rome, of course, went through big upheavals at the end, the fall of the empire and reduced population a lot. And, you know, a lot of the built environment was repurposed and then it was replanned later and so on. So it's it's a complicated example, but but definitely is a much larger city now again, right? Than he, than he was sort of at, at you know, Athens would be another example and so on. So mm -hmm. he needed to reconstitute the, its entire infrastructure, right? And this kind of thing that we're discussing in order to become a modern city with a few million people. So, so that typically needs to happen, but but the places, but what we've been studying is precisely that if you look at function, you don't need to deliver sort of this network infrastructure that changes the cost benefit logic in a way that is on a grid, for example, or that destroys mm -hmm. a lot of the build fabric that's informal. You just need to bring in the network in an incremental but systematic way. And that's what people are thinking about is that instead of going to classical models of planning where you built the infrastructure and that's the most important thing and that you know is going to be built maybe uh, over over the settlement that's there uh, you actually adapt the network to to the settlement that's already there much more as as happened historically particularly in European and old Asian cities and that creates this wonderful fabric right that's kind of more accidental and so on but that in the end are really good cities for people. So that's the idea is that if we understood that process well enough, we actually would make it work that way, natural way, <laughs> instead of our, you know, doing it in a planning way, which tends to be very artificial and destroy actually the social networks that are there and therefore become hard to reconstitute um, mm -hmm. through that intervention. So you have to work with the networks that are there, but you also have to change that character such that they become, um, you know, people can become integrated and better serviced and have a different logic of cost benefit, but also of integration in society. So that's happening everywhere. If you start, if, you know, now that you have that idea, you'll see it everywhere. And you will see as you visit different cities, 
that a lot of them were informal, right? Obviously, historically. But then, you know, in central places of cities, there are always streets and, and piazzas or, or, you know, squares and so on. So you see the network also start forming. The other part of this that I didn't talk about, which is interesting, uh, is that a lot of this network also goes into the third dimension. It needs to go underground and so on, because the network actually is growing faster than, than the settlement, just the, the density of the settlement. This is for reasons that I didn't give you an argument for, but, but the network actually is taking over. And so what you need to do, spatially, it, what you need to do in parts that are denser of the cities to disappear parts of the network. So you want to make the cables and the pipes and all that stuff go underground or overground, also roads in some cases. So that uh, that becomes sort of interesting and it's part of this mismatch of some things that scale. Also the built environment must become taller. So you can mm -hmm. predict uh, the height of buildings. This is also the Romans did a little bit of this, but not a lot. Uh, the buildings need to become higher in order to bring the scaling of incomes along with the scaling of costs of land. Mm -hmm. So, so there are things like this that unless you match these ways in which the city grows, it kind of creates a, a cost like housing becomes too expensive. It's if it's single family housing that kind of arrests the development of the place. So, mm -hmm. but these adaptations are very interesting, and the fact that they could be obtained naturally instead of you know through an artificial process that doesn't understand what's doing functionally so to speak um, is i think where urban planning needs to go interesting so there is another corner like this was like one side of the coin instead of like the actual urban structure the other one is the documentation of it like when you mentioned nolly's map which is uh, ironically not only for the city of rome the most sort of cited kind of uh, example. But if you take any sort of like large overview book written in the last hundred years about cities, it's probably in there. So one of the interesting things, when you say it's the first, so, so as, a, as a specialist for urban city maps, it's not strictly the first map drawn as a compass, but what it is fascinating about it, it's the most precise triangulated summary of knowledge that was produced before. Mm -hmm. And so Thank if you, you like, like Leo Battista Alberti in 1450, which is more or less 300 years earlier, like, you know, to, plus minus two years, uh, triangulated the city and basically wrote a list of coordinates, which you can still draw up and you have a triangulated version of mm -hmm. the city wall of Rome. That's the first sort of like, supposedly first one that we have that is measured in that way. But then we also have the former Orbis Rome from the third century, second, third century, which also yeah. is geometrically congruent with the city. But now what's so spe special about the Nolly map is, is that it's sort of the end point of this sort of like big aggregation of information, measurement of all the stuff you can have, like the nature, the catastrophe boundaries, the ruins, the actual walls you see right now into something that is still the best map. Like if you have the mm -hmm. choice between a random satellite picture some kind of map that somebody produced for some tourist, even if it's an expensive one, and the Nolly map, I would always go with the Nolly map because <laughs> take that, you go to a corner of some house, if there is black in the wall, there is an ancient ruin because Nolly knew and now they don't. And so that is a really interesting thing. So basically there is sort of like the opposite sort of way of thinking about it. I personally think that after Nolly, everything is boring because it's either a reflection of reality <laughs> or sort of a bad copy of Nolly, which is, is right. surreal, which is basically saying the same thing. Now, what does it mean? What is crazy about it is like, if you think about that, it's like, if you look at maps, if you look at depictions of the city, you are actually getting a multitude of things because there's so much diversity because pre Nolly, there is no, it's not set in the stone. And after Nolly, right. you get these like, bad copies of Nolly which are not any better. So you have this kind of like multiple different diversities of imaginations of the city while you sort of like, you know, it's not a bad thing because you run around in the city and you get the actual evidence all the time. So it's all function basically, because all mm -hmm. maps are bad. Now, one of the key things about this is how do we reconstruct the dynamics of the development of cities when this is the situation, when most of the sources are actually bad. And like, let me get to, Urban scaling is an interesting uh, thing. Historically speaking, we did a lot of, there's a lot of work done with the um, estimates of population by Tertius Chandler. This is an individual 
who who believed in the Greek pantheon, that's like his religion, yeah. and wrote a 678 page long typewritten document with uh, estimates of historical places, which is amazing in quality. But of course, he couldn't, you know, he had a boundary, so he couldn't estimate small places. So we have a very similar situation as with these drawn maps. So we are now standing in front of a huge pile of documents about cities. We do science about it, but we have not fully understood how this sort of like inheritance process actually works. It's similar to like this, the, the, this, the, the, you know, this, the, this, the system of 12 and 60 is interesting, but then if you look over the time of the thousands of years in which it came to be, the question, when was the time of people counted to five, counted to 12, counted to 60? <laughs> it's a really interesting thing because in some sense, it's unclear in the co-evolution of cities and discounting systems, what was first. Probably both worked out in the same time. And that actually gets me to the core question. Now, you said evolution needs variation, which is true. And it's interesting because it gives you sort of like the left half of the effective complexity plot of Murray Gell-Mann. So if you're in the if you're in the left corner, nothing can happen because there is not enough variation. If everything's the same, like there can be no interaction. Now, if you go to the middle where there is some variation, you can actually have interaction. But now, if you would go to the end, there is so much variation that nothing can talk to each other anymore because you're in like in, in classical complex systems terms, perfect regularity, perfect chaos, and all the interesting stuff happens in the middle. So do you have anything to say about that other half? Like, like how, does, how do cities maintain from actually going to chaos? Like, like what, what, is, what, what is that other part? Like other than just, oh yeah, let's, let's all have a lot of variation, but like, how do, we, how do we keep talking to each other? I think that is like a really, really pressing question. <laughs> okay, let me try. Um... Yeah, I think you should have Jack Hansen, so I can put you in touch uh, if you're very interested about Rome and maps and what we know. He he really is an amazing expert. So he's, he's also a very nice guy, and you will enjoy talking to him. And he, you, he can tell you a lot more about Rome and, and other sites. Uh, now, so so I, just a few words. I, I think maps are part of this symbolic culture, right? Mm -hmm. So you know. It's uh, and it become very important, right? Because the spaces that we build and that we live in intensely are are largely symbolic, right? So we need a medium that conveys some of that, you know. And the medium is always imperfect, and the medium becomes because these spaces are are built and we adapt to them, right? The medium itself becomes reality to some extent. That's I think part of what you were saying, right? And to what extent <laughs> it does and it doesn't it depends on the place and so on. But uh, but but to the extent that reality or the actual built environment perpetuates uh, <laughs> the the map uh, is is an interesting question. Uh, but the map of also, the, I, I think this is not a rigorous argument, but there's a certain there's a certain tragedy to the places that do uh, something for the first time. They tend to be frozen by it. And often the benefits don't accrue to them; they accrue to other places. So map, once you got a good map, right? Other places use maps in lots of different ways, but but for the place of origin, this happens here a lot in Chicago. We're still fighting the old fights, even though some of what happened here was important elsewhere. But but there are things like that that that's somewhat interesting that have to do with the relationship of that medium to to the structure of the place uh, in that place. And then uh, how it gets exacted to use a, a word from complex systems to other places and takes a more uh, a more creative function. To this issue of diversity and, and how when it's very extreme, uh, what do we do with it? Um, I, I think one interesting question is that whenever people talk about diversity or geneity or I wouldn't call it chaos to begin with, but I, I take your point of very extreme variation. Um, you know, it's both. You know, in most cases, we don't know what to, we don't know what to do with it, and no one in particular needs to do anything about it. What happens is that we have environments that uh, allow some of this uh, diversity to exist and to become latent in terms of its possible functions, in terms of connecting to other bits of the system and creating something new. 
So cities are a bit like that. And of course, this happens in nature as well, but cities definitely as, as human organizations go are probably the best example of that. We go to the internet and argue if it's there or not. But, uh, but the idea is that we allow a lot of diversity of lifestyles, of types of people, of cultures and so on in cities, even though they create at the same time, uh, potentially a lot of uh, latent conflict. And, and, and often these are, these varieties, depending what forms they take, as you know, a lot of urban history, often, you know, there's a dark side to it in which people create ghettos or separations or segregations, right, in order to maintain, but still they're there in the city. And, and even though there are boundaries and both social and physical, they are still interacting with parts of the city in some ways. So, so, so often it cuts both ways that on the one hand, Places like cities, because they're predicated on some of the principles that I was trying to explain, they are keen on variation and its potential uses. So they maintain a certain ambient diversity that is not only structural, structurally embedded already, as, as I was talking in terms of division of labor, but then is latent. It's kind of could allow it in this evolutionary sense to create new things out of that diversity as, as it comes into the system. So that is part of why cities need that and you see they're open systems so again the, the discussion of the zips law what's under it i think is more interesting is to actually track the flows of everything that's coming and going and seeing to what extent those flows then get reflected in growth patterns or not right so the flows are are enormous once you start looking there's mm -hmm. a lot more change that doesn't accumulate so there's a lot of experimentation a lot of people trying to find their niche <laughs> and most of them maybe not finding it but a lot of them you know, trying and succeeding as well. So that's part of the dynamic that's that's happening. But it's part of how it's managed. It's managed very dynamically as a series of many, many, many experiments at individual level mostly, mm -hmm. but also at higher levels. Now, um, the, the 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 last part. So 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 I think that that's that's what's important is, is that in some sense uh, this this diversity and variety is potential. It's future potential, and and I think it's both tolerated and embraced in terms of that, uh, almost almost in a way that we are unaware of consciously, but that it's there and that's what we're learning through these ideas of evolution and looking at innovation also in human societies and so on. So in that sense, it's it's sustained and supported to, to a large extent and more so, as you know, in, in cities that are more open, more often, if you will, more creative and prosperous, not always, but also in organizations and parts of the cities and subpopulations, they're more dedicated to innovation. They tend to be more open to diversity, right? I mean, this is not just a cliche, it's true if you actually measure it. And so it's because I think intuitively they're sensing that that's necessary for their function and for their own channeling of their ideas through time. And so I think that that's that engine that we kind of are beginning to understand more formally it's been there all along and exists clearly in cities uh but but it's something that i think we're all studying better and better and trying to understand better and try to be able to say that a certain level that that diversity in general is is positive it's not just a bug it's also a feature uh how much is too much then that becomes a question i think of whether more diversity or more variety or more chaos entails costs so, what costs does it entail immediately? So there's all, often a trap that it has, like with migration, for example. It has immediate costs because people need to be supported. They take space, they need housing, and the benefits come down the road, right? As people integrate, are able to bring what they have to, to the larger community of the city. So this mismatch of time scales often creates a lot of issues because you see first competition and the short-term zero-sum game kind of developed. And it's always typically over the longer term that the advantages of diversity and integration and, and interdependence uh, tell. And so this is why often it requires public management. It's yeah. not just something that you do individually. I, 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 I now regret using the word chaos. Like obviously um, what, I, what I meant is like if you have hundred yeah, different yeah. people that they're all sort of like unique um, and don't have any overlap. Um, let me ask you for- there, there can be behaviors that are very disruptive of Yes, innovation is disruptive, even if it is ultimately positive. It's always disruptive of the way the system is working. So that is important, is that cities are interesting. And, and again, this is not very common in natural systems. You see it sort of at the ecosystem level. Mm -hmm. But but 
a city dies if it's not disrupted, right? So part of what is interesting is that it's open and seems to continue how these scaling properties because it's quite open and because the people that will be there in 20 years are not the same people and they'll be doing different things. But, mm -hmm. you know, it's Shanghai, but it's like that's happening all the time. And so that's actually essential, but at the same time, it's very disruptive. So there's always this very strong tension between, you know, the people who are there and are doing well at the moment and the people that are trying to come in and the diversity that's trying to come in and be expressed as the future. And that is a wonderful thing. I mean, but it's this struggle, this almost dialectic is really at the root of the city. And it requires a lot of these, it does require ultimately not only mm -hmm. culture and law that's, you know, that's no longer personal, but it's impersonal even to the newcomer, even if they're a migrant or somebody who's formerly an outsider of some form, but that also, uh, you know, exercises that sort of openness in terms of a public institution. This is very hard to do, as you know, and, mm -hmm. but it's essential. So let me, but it's let, a long-term thing. Let, let me ask a follow-up question. So the diversity is sort of something which uh, goes, is not only a thing that is constructed in how it's maintained, but it's also in like, you know, there's a sort of saying in Germany that like, uh, the most xenophobic people are in places where there is no foreigners, right? And so if you're in New York City, you see lots of different right. people. Not only yeah, yeah, is yeah. there diversity, you're exposed to the diversity. So you learn to live together, even though, you know, you may not be the person who smokes pot at three in the afternoon every block on a, on a bench. But, you know, that kind of thing, and, and they, they're not going to be uh, a resistance right. or an artist or, and so, so, but still we can live with each other. So. Now, there is a lot of uh, things where uh, sort of segregation is nurtured, which is another form of diversity, which is a kind of diversity where people don't see each other. And I'm, this, this harks back to what happened Saturday at the uh, Allen Premium Outlets, which I lived 14 minutes by car oh, wow. from it. Yeah. And so this was very predictable to happen because it's, you, you see things where there is a diversity that's nurtured by people who, you know, like uh, who want to have segregate schooling systems where people don't learn about evolution. They only learn about their particular interpretation of the Bible, different rivaling me mega churches who wouldn't mm -hmm. talk to the people on the other side of the street, people who are more proud boy like people who are. Um, you know, a liberal, but still like guns. In this particular case, I encourage you to look at the advertising, the mall actually uh, sort of published in the last couple of weeks. Um, so there, there is for, for men, military gear, and you know, there's very clear- uh, Yeah, I would say that that's- going on. Yeah. So this kind of stuff is, is, is also forms of diversity, which if you look at the growth of Dallas-Fort Worth in the last 30 years, you can see that there's all these really sort of like monocultural, satellites neighborhoods which are very segregated so you can live down the road there is i don't know seventy thousand sick and you don't see a single one of them ever in like right. five years but then there is this moment when sort of clashes can happen when you know sort of the proud boy goes proud boy goes into the liberal mall and guns down people because this is what he sees as least you know he's he, he didn't encounter that that this is humans. He can completely dehumanize these people because he never ever goes there. And so the question is, is that something where, uh, can, we, can we see this more systematically? Is there something where urban structures, where stuff like that happens in larger densities? Do they have certain features? Is that part of the architecture? Is there something where, is, is that like, how, how does Christian fundamentalism grow, for example? Is that something that is built by people or is it something that just, is it just rhetoric or is this physical urban architecture? I'm asking a question because my feeling is the second. And I have not seen any kind of research that actually opens that kind of worms. Right. Um... I mean, I'm I'm not an expert in this particular situation. I, I wasn't even aware of it because I, I mean I knew it had happened, but but mm -hmm. the motivations. Um, so let me take it to a somewhat different place, but hopefully come back to your question. It's 
you know, uh, even in this model that I flashed briefly, a uh, subcultural model of, of um, urbanism. So, but th there's, a, there's a certain sense in which these subcultures uh, can exist within a city or within a larger society, which I think you're referring to is, uh, to some extent, it's not just the city or, uh, in, in Texas. And, um, and, and they coexist because they can be, you know, they form groups. And within mm -hmm. these groups, they're quite cohesive and certain beliefs, certain identities, uh, well, whatever it is can exist and be sustained at least for a while. And, and these can be weird and violent even, right? And so the question then is that, so, so that is very human, right? So humans typically organize themselves uh, socially in order to be social you need to share something. So that's a weird medium that where, whether it's a religious belief or a certain ethos of, of life or a certain set of beliefs can unify a group of people. And that can, inside the group, provide you with some support, right? And some encouragement. And that has definitely its dark side. Mm -hmm. um, but it's also a good thing in many, in many ways, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a source of support to many people in many different situations. So it's a, it's a difficult thing. Now, the point about this is, is, is also the intergroup conflict, right? The fact that you now have groups with certain beliefs and they could actually form bigger groups that cooperate and do interesting things, but they can also enter conflict. And now intergroup conflict is even worse than individual conflict because a group can be more powerful and so on. And so this is where you need public regulation. So you cannot have, meaning some regulation of conflict at a larger scale which is usually a public entity like a government that mm -hmm. imposes values, but also imposes penalties on conflict and imposes penalty and, and, and imposes some playing field where every group, every person has some rights. So this is what I think, and that is encoded softly through values and then has to also be encoded through law enforcement and so on. So this is, I think, where the United States is failing uh, and, and many places in the world are struggling which is that on the one hand, we've had you know several decades of promoting individualism and disconnected diversity, if you will. So it's interesting when it's important, it's very urban, when these identities, these groups come together, they need to live together, right? And good things come out of that because compromises, you know, rules that allow everyone to coexist, that, that's very urban, right? It's kind of this tension, it's tense, but somehow it works. And to, to your question about that, we, we're doing a few studies with, with psychologists where, where some of these things become apparent. And we have a preprint out, actually, it's not published yet, but it's on, this one is on racism. And it's, 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 it's on implicit biases. So to, it asks people, it, it does a, a psychological test of implicit racial biases to see if people are um, identifying races with good, with positive and negative connotation words and so on. <clears throat> and so you can tell if people are implicitly being racist or not. But what we find again is that people in larger cities are a little less racist. Mm -hmm. And the interpretation is not that they're nice people, you know, if you've been to a large city, you know, it's kind of tough, but that they're probably more exposed. So our interpretation, and, and it works out empirically with the patterns we see, is that people are just more exposed to diversity and that they, it, it normalizes it, just as you were saying. Uh, and, and that becomes basically something that, okay, you know, it may be different, but I, I don't think it has a particular valence. You know, there are all kinds of people in all kinds of ways, right? Uh, and, so, and so that the connotation of a certain group with a certain set of values kind of washes out. Now, unless that diversity is kind of an interaction like this, it doesn't happen, right? So these groups become more extreme. And then if you cannot regulate their, their conflict or their latent conflict, then you have violence so that's also that's what we're seeing and so the, in the united states on the one hand we've had values in politics that have been promoting some of that and at the same time you know we have the conditions like guns and so on that also promote that and make it easier and then we don't seem to have um you know either penalties at some point that discourage that and that but i think fundamentally is a set of values that this interviolence uh between groups is not acceptable Right, and so you cannot create a city. Certainly, in cities, you know, it's it's known that that's not acceptable, and more or less people get to terms with it. And it's always difficult, but I think in these exurban and 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 outside cities, which often have to are, are more prone to this kind of extremism, then you get you get this this kind of dynamics 
to go unregulated, so to speak. And then with all the other latent conditions, it, it unfortunately results in these very tragic events. But but that's, you know, this has been studied a bit through group dynamics, through, uh, um, uh, you know, multi, you know uh, group competition and so on and evolutionary models like the price equation and so on that tell you that there's intergroup conflict and uh, you need to somehow have a, a layer on top that creates, makes that competition actually not produce too many costs. And in fact, maybe in some cases produce a good for the system as a whole. Markets are a good example, very different channel. But the idea markets are, you know, conceptualized is that you have companies, corporations in competition, right? To sell to sell a product. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that's not a good thing necessarily in terms of creating, you know, uh, a well-functioning market for the consumer or for society. Because, you know, they want to cheat and use violence and do all kinds of things that companies do in order to exclude the rivals. So unless you kind of create a system of competition that also creates good things like innovation and better products and so on, which doesn't happen without some regulation, then the whole competition thing blows the system apart. And so this happens uh, along identities, but also happens in other places. So this multi-group structure of of competition and cooperation is very important. And, you know, this is also what people like Peter Turchin and so on are trying to use in terms of trying to predict, uh, you know, collapses of, of certain national systems at some points and so on. So these ideas are still a little latent, but I think we have a few tools to model them. It's, but you know, but you still have to, once you understand the basics of what needs to be done, the problem is to do it. And in certain political moments, that's very hard. Thank you very much. There is there's no hands raised. We got five minutes and actually you just made one statement about Peter Turgeon, which actually there's a question I noted down as a last question is like, will there be a catalog of fundamental patterns? So like rise and fall, collapse, like obviously, you know, whatever Peter's Peter Turgeon's sine waves in history. <laughs> but so No, I wouldn't say, yeah, I don't I'm not so much uh I was, I'm reading his last book, Age, Age of Dis Ages of Discord, which I like. Uh, I'm I'm not such a big fan of the cycles in history. Um, yeah, me neither. <laughs> right. Okay. Just to say that, but but I think I think the dynamic. I was just talking to the dynamic of intergroup conflict, which which is a uh, that's a universal of both nature and human societies. Um, you know, you basically escalate. You know differences as well as cooperations also at group levels and so this becomes a sort of more complex structure that also has its own escalation which is interesting both for innovation and for and for conflict so um so that's better understood and it's the logic of the first slide i showed you of how nature forms collectives and how they regulate it how they have to have informational media and so on so that's better understood but still we don't necessarily have a predictive theory that tells you you know here's what's going to happen in, in a simple way. I think there's some progress there. I don't think that there's a catalog of patterns to answer your question necessarily, but there's sort of phases of behavior, right? Where you can have a system that some of the things we were talking about here can work so that, you know, uh, a city that's working is open, it's allowing diversity, it's allowing uh, people coming in and out, and it's creating structures that, uh, you know, create, a, social advantage out of the differences between people in terms of creating complementarities, interdependencies, and regulations that allow the whole system to actually be more productive than smaller systems or the sum of the parts. So that happens all the time and we should be happy about that. It's amazing. The world we live in is a cooperative world, actually. Uh, at the same time, there can be, and that has a certain set of patterns to it, that whether they are explicitly in cities where you see certain numbers or in other networks where you may see other numbers, but these superlinearities, sublinearities, I think are now to be expected. Mm -hmm. I think on the other hand, there are patterns of collapse or at least instabilities where those benefits disappear or are overcome by costs. And that typically has to do with intergroup conflict, just as you're mm -hmm. bringing up and the benefits not being realizable. Often, as I was starting to say, I'm, I'm worried, I'm, I'm interested in this problem, but I, I'm struggling to create a good enough model and place to study it, which has to do with the fact that most of the problems where uh, the questions where we need to create 
uh, transformational uh, solutions for society, whether it's carbon or environmental management or conflict, they're kind of long-term problems, right? We need to operate a scale of 20, 30 years, right? You see that with carbon now, for example. Mm -hmm. but, but conflict and costs and survival is every day, right? So there's a mismatch of time scales, and this brings in even issues of discounting. Uh, what you know, what time scale are you wanting to solve the problem, and so on? So, so often these issues of competition and conflict are very immediate and very clear and present, whereas the issues by which we could collaborate and create something new that's better are much much more difficult, much more contingent, and require more time and more scale. Mm -hmm. And they're very difficult because of that. So people really need to believe that that's possible. They need to work in that direction. But there's a certain instability that's latent in creating these larger structures. They're not apparent in the in the short-term cost benefit. In fact, they're disadvantaged by the short-term cost benefit. And so that transition, as it were, um, what makes it possible and what makes it impossible is kind of interesting from the perspective of the ideas we're discussing here. So there's collapse and instability, but there's also these transformations and when they can happen to a system that now embeds larger yeah. scale cooperation at some scale. So, so would that result in something like a uh, sort of urban version of what E.O. Wilson calls the new social transition? There's this kind of like emergence yeah. of altruism that um, like this is so weird because there's evolutionary game theory models that explain it, but these models are obviously too complicated for anybody in the public. <laughs> so everybody knows what's, what's, what, what is the mechanism. So, 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 so why, why do people follow that? So we're, we're not getting closer to that, basically. Why do people on average- I think people follow that. I think it's just that, so I think that there are costs, it's more or less what I said. I think people know that's good to work with other people. And mm -hmm. then amazing things are possible when that happens. Look, you know, yeah. I'll look at your city. I mean, it's amazing, right? It's it's kind of amazing once you stop to think about it. How did we do this? It's unbelievable. It's true. But at the same time, you ask, I mean, we should really stop and think about that because it's it's kind of, that's really the elephant in the room. We do it all the time. Mm -hmm. And we have an intuition for it. We just don't call it out. And we're always calling the bad parts and not the good parts. But <laughs> uh, but But then, you know, I think that the conflict is very clear and present. People are very tuned to it. And even issues of inequality, issues of fairness, you know, these are very hard to do in a dynamical society that's open and so on. Where people, particularly when people start being shaky or having a shaky confidence in the future and on the justice of the collective mechanisms through government and others that will redistribute benefits and as well as costs, right? If there's no confidence that we can get to the future together and it's going to be good for me, it's very hard to move everybody there. And I think that that is true. That we, you know, the last few years, I mean, where you are too, it's a time of instability and more conflict than we expected. And, and so unless, uh, so people see, again, in the short term, everything is much more conflict prone and closer to zero sum. You see this sort of as you formalize decision theory. Well, on a larger scale, like the use of sociality has benefits, but you have to get there. And then mm -hmm. when you get there, it has to be fair. I had a little slide about that. I flashed quickly. The redistribution of benefits from the collective gain has to be fair. And that is very hard. And now we're talking, when we talk about problems of climate, problems of development and so on, it's hard enough to do it in a large country like the United States or the EU perhaps, but, it, but we're talking about worldwide institutions, right? They allow mm -hmm. us to get there. And we have some, like the UN, but they don't have a lot of executive power or, or enforcement power. Do they have a new medium? Maybe they do have a new medium, but it, it's not apparent what that is exactly. So I think a lot of the ingredients that you need to get there are forming before our eyes. If you have an analytical eye now, you'll see them. But they're not there yet in terms of convincing people that the future is fair and it's worth it and it's collective. Nice. Um... If you have two minutes after I close this up, it would be great. So I have to close down the um, the, sort of the broadcast. Um, so this was the last Open Lab seminar um, in this semester. In the next semester, we will not return with a regular Open Lab seminar series. We will return at the end of the semester with the Cultural Data Analytics Conference 2023 on December 14 to 16, uh, happening here in Tallinn, Estonia. Um, so there is currently, uh, we are preceding the sending out the call, 
building the program committee and so on. Um, and so that is something which we try to bring together a uh, similar crowd of people as the uh, Institute of Pre Applied Mathematics uh, long program at UCLA in 2016, which would brought together 150 practitioners from cultural uh, culture analytics, as it was called, preceding Lev Manovich's book of cultural analytics. And so it would be great to have a similar sort of um, crowd of people, which not only includes digital and computational humanities, but also uh, sort of cultural complexity, topics that are typically not represented, methods that are typically not represented in digital humanities, but are found in a broader cultural humanities sort of uh, community. We will also do a different form of open lab event uh, in, uh, the, in the fall, which has to do with public stakeholders and uh, industry um, related to cultural data analytics, which we will also announce. And so with that, um, if you watch us on YouTube, thank you very much for um, uh, staying with us. And uh, so thanks again to Luis Bettencourt for giving us this fantastic insight into the uh, state of the art of city science. Uh, this is super exciting and uh, this is probably going on for at least uh, a number of careers uh, because this is something which in the study of cities is sort of new. Uh, it was, you have shown roots in the 60s and 70s. There's obviously a lot of urbanism that is like way older, but uh, this is something where not all work is done. And it's uh, it seems to me, for example, uh, a genre other than text, images, audiovisual material, which is sort of underestimated because it's it's also a cultural material basically and needs to be seen as such. And so that is something which I find super exciting and you, your work sort of exemplifies super well. So thank you very much. And so I'm gonna stop the recording.